morning. Okay, good morning. We are Tanya, chapter 34. And um, a very informative and important chapter. We talked about uh, last week, we talked about the great joy that Hashem has of our relationship, that uh, the relationship that Hashem has with every human being, and the joy that, that Hashem has, and the joy that we have as a result, that we can give joy to Hashem. Um, but knowing that and meditating that there's a, a very, uh, there's an intimate, close relationship with Hashem um, makes, empowers us, gives us the, the strength, the motivation, and the excitement to do the mitzvah, to do our mission in this world, to make this world a better place. That we're not here just by mistake, that we're not just here to you know, kind of uh, eat, sleep, work. And, and hit repeat, but there's, there's really meaning and purpose to all that we do. And that meaning and purpose is not just a, uh, you know, a little rock that you throw in the, in the ocean, you think that has no effect, but it makes a tremendous effect, um, starting with the idea that the whole creation was created so, so we, the people, we, every human um, should, should do Hashem's will, should make this world a place for Hashem. And this is what we talked about, to make a dwelling place for Hashem. What is, what, is the, what, is the, what is the meaning when we say to make a dwelling place for Hashem? So let me go back a bit. We spoke about that, what's the purpose and mission. We, all, we always use the word tikkun olam. Tikkun olam means to, to fix the world, translated. But everybody has a, really, a different definition or they have their own interpretation what means tikkun olam to them? It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful concept, it's a beautiful word, but it's not just beautiful, but it's actually the integral part of why we're here. In other words, you can see the world as as I am, I am, I am here in this world, and the, so I'm in existence. The world is in existence, and I have to, uh, and, and and part of part of me being in this world, I like to work on tikkun olam, like it's like a it's part of my um, my belt on sound. So, what's important though is that this is not just a part of what I like to do. You know, we look at so many times as a mitzvah or tikkun olam or tzedakah or. Torah study or building a synagogue, we'll look at it as, um, as like a volunteer job, like a volunteer um, activity that I like to do. Why? Because it's fulfilling, right? It's, it's fulfillment. There's a fulfillment when you feel that you're making a change, you're making a difference, which is all beautiful and right, but we are going much deeper than that. We are not saying that tikkun olam and, and doing mitzvot is a nice thing to do. It makes you feel good. It makes other people feel good. No, the whole, the whole purpose of why you were created, and not only why you were created, the whole purpose, why the whole universe was created, why God created the world, was for the purpose of making the world a place for Hashem, which is tikkun olam, to make a dwelling place for Hashem. So what does it mean? So it's not like, okay, it's something nice I will do uh, once a week, one hour a day, uh, you know, when I retire. You know, the, the, the concept of bringing Hashem, Hashem to this world, to making a dwelling place, you want to call it tikkun olam, is the whole purpose of creation. When we say purpose of creation, what is the, what, what is, why, is, why is purpose of something so important? When, we, when you build a, a building, when you build a house, when you build a building, you build a business, what is the most important part when you start a building, when you start a business, and when you continue day to day in your business? What is the most important element that comes, that comes to, 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 what's the foundation of every business? Anybody want to answer? I'll tell you the first rule of architecture is Form follows function. So it's similar in concept to what you're saying, like what is the functionality? What is the purpose? 
And then the design evolves around what that purpose is. Exactly. So, 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 so the most important part of any business is to have a mission statement. Yeah. What is the mission? What is the purpose of your business? Because, and, 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 and interestingly enough, many, many businesses don't have a mission statement. They don't even know what the mission statement is. And, and if it's only about making money, that's, not, that's typically not just enough. So, so for sure, when it comes to, uh, that's in business. Okay, so most businesses, the purpose is to make money. But many people, if, if you have a, if you have a, if you have a, a business that is imbued with a purpose and meaning, then the whole business activity becomes the innovation and, and going out of the box expands. That's true. Think about the great companies, right? Um, 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 that, that, that created a certain, a, a certain uh, mission and they were driven by that mission. Uh, you know, take Apple or, or Tesla or Starbucks, all those companies have great, they had the vision pretty, they had big visions and, were, and, and they were focused on that vision and allowed them to innovate and expand. Just an example in business, if you agree or don't agree, that doesn't matter right now. How much more so is that important with our lives? So if you believe that our life, you're just here by, mis by, by, by mistake, not by mistake, haphazard. Like there is no purpose and meaning by you coming to this world. You know, your parents were together and you, you were born, whoop de doo right? And, 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 and things just happen. There's no like meaning and purpose. So then your life is not driven by, you, you, your, your life is not necessarily, you don't look at your life necessarily with, that there's a purpose and meaning. So you live life, you live life to what? To enjoy yourself, to, to be successful, et cetera. But if you believe that there's a God in the world and God created the world and God created you and each individual with a purpose and meaning. So the first question you wanna ask yourself is so what is my purpose? What is my mission? And, and peeling back, so if I have a purpose and meaning, what is the purpose that God created the world? What is it, create, what is all, what, what is it all about? So, so really getting to that, we need to, uh, um, we need to look into what does is, what is Hashem want? So, we, so, so that's what we're saying. Hashem's purpose of creation, creating the world was to create a dwelling place for Hashem. What is, the, what is the definition of dwelling place? When we say to dwell, it means to create a home. It means a place where Hashem feels very, very comfortable. In a home, you feel comfortable. If you don't feel comfortable in your home, then something is wrong with your home, right? A home is a place where you need to feel comfortable, where you need to feel your true self. When Hashem says, create me a home, Hashem wants to feel extremely comfortable. But I'm going to even one step deeper and peel back one more layer. And that is, there is the, there is the inner will, there's the inner will of Hashem and there's the outer will. Similar to our own way we operate, there can be, um, there's, there, there is, there's an outer will and there's an inner will. What's an outer will? An outer will is, I wanna go on vacation, right? Example, I wanna go on vacation. That's my will, my desire. But what's the deep, what's the inner will? The inner will is, but why do you wanna go on vacation? What's, what's dragging you? What's pushing you to, to go on vacation? So we are ma many times, we just, we don't even know why we need it. There's a certain push. I need to go to synagogue. I need to buy this and this because I want it. But why do you want it? So, so sometimes we are subconscious. We don't even, we don't, we don't think about why 
We just know I need it. Sometimes I, I can't explain it. It's just, it's just a very powerful uh, desire. I can't explain it. They say in, 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 the, in the Zohar, there was, there, was, there was a debate why Hashem wanted the world. Why did Hashem want to create the universe? So the one school of thought was Hashem wanted to, Hashem who is the ultimate of good, in order to be good, you need to have a recipient. You can't be good without a recipient, right? If I want to be good and sitting, if I'm sitting in a bunker and I want to be good all day long, there's nobody around me, nobody to give, then what is the good is not it's just in potential, it's not in actuality. So one school of thought in the Zora says Hashem kind of wanted to create a recipient to be able to get his goodness. So that's the reason why Hashem created a world. Comes to Zohar and says, if so, if that's the reason, why would Hashem need to create a physical universe? But that angels are just are just enough. Angels are beings, are spiritual beings, but there are beings that are recipients of Hashem's glory, Hashem's light, and Hashem's goodness. So if that's the case, that the purpose of creation is Hashem, that should be a recipient. So why create humans? Why create a physical world? It's just enough. The first thing Hashem did was create the spiritual worlds, create a- angels, and it could have stopped right there. Says the Zohar, you know what's the reason? Hashem created the world, and this is the language in Tanya, because Nesava HaKadosh Baruch is Leidira Betachtainen. Hashem desired to have a dwelling place in this world. So what is the word desire? Desire, the Zohar says, I, when it comes to desire, and we, all, we are all reflect, ref, created in Hashem's image, we reflect Hashem, but just like by a human being, what's the, what's the most powerful force in a human being? So we have emotions, we have intellect, and just like in Kabbalah, the tree of life, right? What's the highest level? Intellect. The brain, intellect. But in Kabbalah, we have something that's above intellect. It's called Kesser. Yeah. Right? What's Kesser? Kesser is the crown. Crown. Crown is what's sitting above intellect, and that is the power of will, the willpower, desires, pleasure. Power of will and pleasure, which kind of go together, is higher, more powerful than your intellect. Why? Because it's the essence of who you are. It's, it's the essential, it is the, is the essential will of who you are, because in order to have thoughts, in order to think about something, there has to be a will, there has to be a, a desire to want to think about something. So you have to create the, what creates the, the, the ability to think, to utilize the brain to think and come up with ideas and wisdom, etc. So what activates will? If the will activates Chachma bin Adas with the knowledge understanding, so what activates will? The answer is absolutely nothing. Why? Because the will and your soul is one. There is no before and after. There is no, I need to create a certain will. Now, the, the truth is that many times it also goes the other way around, meaning if I understand that this, um, 
this diet is going to be beneficial for me, that will create a willpower I want to go on a diet, right? Correct? So, however, the willpower is always inside of me. It's always who I am. It's always in the, in the essential core essence of who I am. And the, 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 the mind can activate, can activate certain willpower, but the willpower does not, does not, does not really get created. The reason I'm going a little bit, I'm, I'm going in that way is, so the Zohar says as follows, we know what Hashem wanted us to do in this world, what the mission, what the purpose is. Hashem said it. Hashem says in the Torah, we're going to read it in a few weeks, but also the Mikdash, create for me a tabernacle, the Shechanti Besaychem, and I will dwell in it. I want to dwell in this physical world. So that's the per that's that's the mission. What make a home for Hashem? The why. So that's the what, right? That's the what is the mission? What's the purpose? The why. So what is the why? What's the reason? But the Alter Rebbe writes, Russian Yiddish. A taiva, a taiva is a desire. And Yiddish say of a taiva is concussionish. On the desire, you can't ask any questions. Why? Because it, it, it's above logic. The desire of why Hashem wanted this world, the desire why Hashem wanted a dwelling place, is above logic. You can ask. You can't. There's no. There's no logic to that. I know what it is. I know what the desire is. You know, the, the, the stupid example I always bring. Some people can wake up at two in the morning and go down to the refrigerator to take out ice cream. They have a desire to eat ice cream, right? It, it, it defines logic. You're tired, it's unhealthy, but you, you can't stop it. You have that desire, that urge, and you go and you yeah, take the ice cream, eat the ice cream. Someone's gonna ask you, well, why are you doing it? What do you mean, why? I, 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 I want to eat it. I have a desire. Avatayv is concussionish. That's not to negate, oh, you know, Zor couldn't figure it out. Zor couldn't figure out why Hashem had the desire. It's, it's actually to bring out and this is so critical on what's going to elaborate here in this chapter. That when we say will, when I get to the will of a person, when I get to my will, I'm touching essence. It's the core essence. When I connect to a person through an action, And I connect to you, to a child or to a spouse through action. Give them a gift, right? I help them. It's still a very external connection. It's my action connecting to their action. Deeper than that is emotion, right? If I can love somebody, if I can, if I can show sympathy to somebody else, now I'm connecting deeper. Deeper than that is wisdom. If I grasp somebody's understanding, teacher, child, teacher, student, right? If the student understands the wisdom of a teacher, or if the student uh, understands the wisdom of a the teacher, there's a, there's a strong connection because now they're connected also in their minds. The deepest connection you can have. You're relaxed. And your desires connect. Okay. When we connect to Hashem, when we 
uh, when we're saying what is it that I want to that I want to accomplish? Plug in my laptop. Yes, please. Yeah, hold on. I'm going to fix it. You hear me now? Yeah. Okay. When I say when when we want to when I say that the that that, there, that there's a desire of Hashem, and it is it's above logic, then if I then 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 by 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 definition, this is where the essence of Hashem is. So, I Hashem says I want my essence to be in this world. And Sasham used the word, make me a dwelling place, make me a home. Because just like in a home, that's where a person is in their core essence, right? In the home, the wills and the pleasures are freely expressed. When you are out on the street, all of a sudden mind kicks in, action kicks in, you behave in a certain way, but it's not your core essence. At home, all that gets peeled away. Everything is, there's no filters, and that's where you are in your core essence. Hashem wants his essence to be in this world. Hashem doesn't want only his external layer, so to speak, to have an effect, but Hashem wants his core essence. What is his core essence? His will and desire. What is the will and desire? And how, how, do I, how do I bring that? How do I make that happen? How do I make Hashem's essence, Hashem's will and desire happen that he feels at home? Our will. Huh? Our will and desire is towards him. And that's the connection that brings him back into what you're calling, referring to as the home. Right. But, 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 but practically speaking, practically speaking, how how do I how do I make a home for Hashem? Prayer. Huh? Faith. Prayer. Pray. Prayer. Prayer. Faith. Well, it, it, we're gonna read, read now in chapter thirty-four. That's where mitzvah comes into play. Because mm -hmm. what is a mitzvah? mitzvah a connection. Yeah, but, but but why is it a connection? Because because mitzvah is the desire of Hashem, is the will of Hashem. When you fulfill the desire of Hashem, you are creating that essential connection, the home of Hashem, as we just spoke about. Uh, and then the, there's different levels of mitzvahs. Certain mitzvahs express the deeper desire of Hashem a lot more than others. So, in in, in as, when you have when you have a when you can have a um, you can have a connection to um, it, and, and again, back to relationships, right? The, the, the relationship, if a relationship is just based on action or just based on um, uh, intellect, it's limited in nature. Because um, intellect, for example, is as much as my understanding works, that's how much I connect. When, and it requires a certain identity of myself in the, in, in the relationship. I need to use my brain to try to understand my teacher. Will, how do you connect to do somebody's will, what's the deepest connection? By suspending yourself. The, the less there is of you, the stronger the connection to the will that you are connecting to. When we make a blessing, when we make a mitzvah, we make a blessing. And we express that the blessing is the will of Hashem. So a mitzvah gives me the ability to be less of myself 
and allow Hashem inside of me and inside my home to make Hashem feel comfortable. Let's read inside. Chapter 34. 378. Page 378. You, you can be a temple for God. Section 1, A Brief History of Divine Revelation. In chapter 33, we learn to meditate on the joy um, of our faith in God's non-dual presence, making God at home here on earth. But faith is experienced only in certain elevated part of your mind and heart. And it also fluctuates with time. How do you fill all of your consciousness and being with God's non-dual presence all of the time? Chapter 34 argue that Torah study, particularly in the area of Jewish law, achieves this goal. But to understand why that is the case, you first must trace the history of elevated consciousness in Judaism. Beginning with the patriarchs leading up to the event at Sinai and beyond. So in general, when we say um, faith, believing you know it's 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 really it's really what we're talking about here is consciousness how much how much consciousness elevated consciousness do you have and how often is it so let's start with the patriarchs but the patriarchs were like those you know i call them super su super super beings or super beings they were they were like you know, something beyond that we cannot even get too close to. But let's first, let's first do a case study on them. So let's read on that. Now this is known, Isaiah 12, 5, that the patriarchs were generally a chariot to God uh, throughout all their days. What's the definition of a chariot, by the way? We learned it in chapter, uh, chapter 23 or chapter 18. A chariot, uh, a chariot is completely um, nullified to the horse that's pulling the chariot. The chariot has no own will. So when when Isaiah calls the uh, the uh, patriarchs and matriarchs chariots to Hashem, means that they were completely com com there was complete bitul. There was complete self nullification. They were they were they were one hundred percent vehicles to Hashem. They have no own desires or own individual. Um, 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 saying, I would like to do this, I would like, everything that they wanted was completely in line with Hashem. Although all their days, they, didn't, they did not interrupt even for a moment the mind and soul connection with the mass of the world at the level of egoless devotion to God's non-dual oneness mentioned above, at its core, Judaism is the experience of divine consciousness in the human mind. The patriarchs achieved this constantly which is why they are considered the founders of our faith. And following the elevated states of mind reached by the patriarchs where, where all the prophets, each one reaching an elevated state of mind corresponding to his soul's level of mental capacity. The level of Moshe, a teacher of blessed memory surpasses them all so that they said of him, the Shekhinah, the divine presence, speaks from the throat of Moshe without any filter at all, quotes from the Zohar. Moses, Moshe was able to render himself as a perfect non-resistant channel, making no modification or, or stylistic change to the word of God that he received. So the common experience of the patriarchs, prophets of Moshe, which makes them all key figures in Judaism was that their heightened state of mind with their awareness of divine reality. While the patriarchs experienced this on a, on, a, on a purely personal level, Moshe was able to share some of his elevated consciousness with others. And standing at Mount Sinai, the Jewish people merited a glimmer of this level of mosaic pro prophecy. But there is an inherent problem with sharing a higher state of mind. If you're not ready and prepare for it, you won't be able to cope with it. And that's why at Sinai, the Jewish people couldn't recontain the experience. But the Israelites at Sinai were unable to withstand it, as the sages of less memory taught, at every divine utterance, the soul flew away. This is the, this, this departure of souls being the complete extinguishing of individual identity, which was just described in reference to Mesha. So the challenge then was, how do we make a glimmer to the experience of Mesha and the other elevated minds, prophets, patriarchs available to the community of ordinary people? 
And therefore, since the Jewish people were unable to contain this level of revelation with their minds straight after the event of Sinai, God instructed them to make another structure in which this revelation could be manifest, namely the tabernacle inside where there would be a holy of holies for the Shekhinah to rest, namely a revelation of God's non-dual oneness on earth, as we'll explain below in chapter 53. But since the people's mind couldn't contain the awareness of God's non-dual presence, a physical structure was made instead to house the revelation. So just to, 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 to stop for a moment, what, was, what happened here? Basically, we are no level of, 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 of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, no level of Moshe, of any of the prophets. They were able to achieve complete oneness, so to speak, complete uh, elevated consciousness that they became a, a complete vehicle to Hashem. And when Moshe was giving us the Torah, which was that revelation, we couldn't contain it. People expired, as we read just from the Talmud. And every divine utterance, the souls flew away. Our, soul, our souls were not vehicles, were not vessels, were not receptacles for that powerful light of Hashem. That Moshe had no problem just, uh, just letting it flow. Hashem spoke through his throat, meaning there was no filter. But we are not those, we don't have those receptacles, vessels. So what, what did Hashem say? And by the way, that's why 40 days later, I, the Jewish people worshipped an idol. Think about it. 40 days earlier, they were witnessing the greatest revelation of godliness. 40 days later, they're, 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 they're worshipping an idol. How is that possible? They witnessed the 10 plagues in Egypt, the splitting of the sea. If you see the splitting of the sea, if you see, if you hear God's voice, 40 days later, are you going to worship an idol? So, but, but why did, why, why what, what, what happened was it was all like bus, it was like a, a, this unbelievable light just being coming down on them. They were not ready. They were not, they were, couldn't even absorb it. Didn't stick. So right away Hashem says, after the golden calf, the first thing Hashem says, after the second tablets were given on Yom Kippur, on the, 120 days after giving them the Torah. So 40 days after of Torah, they worship the idol. 80 days, Moshe is on the mountain begging Hashem for forgiveness. The Jewish people are repenting. Yom Kippur comes, the tent of, of Tishrei. Hashem says, I forgive you. And the first commandment, Hashem says, now I want you to build me a tabernacle. Hashem said, for people other than Moshe, you need to have a physical structure, the more tangible, for people to grasp the whole idea. So we had a temple, we had a tabernacle 40 years in the desert. Then the Jewish people come into Israel and they have, um, they have, a, they have a temple, two temples. Um, but what happened? The temple got destroyed. Today we don't have a temple anymore. The temple got destroyed 2,000 years ago. Where is the dwelling place for God? Ah, so where is the dwelling place? There we go. Where is the dwelling place? So let's see what it, what he says. So since so this is let's let's continue. Three eighty in the bottom. Since the holy temple was destroyed, the blessed holy one has had no dwelling place in his world for his oneness, no firm place for his resting, other than the four cubits of Jewish law halacha. Since the laws, halachos, which have been codified for us, expresses God's undiluted will and wisdom, the destruction of the temple did not result in God's presence being banished from any earthly presence. Now it's available in the four cubits of Jewish law, quote unquote, I'm going to elaborate soon, in our sacred text, which is delineated how mitzvot are to be observed. Well, so much has changed throughout the biblical era, the temple era, and the rabbinic era. It's always been possible to embrace the presence of God in the biblical area. This was achieved through elevated prophetic minds in the temple era, the full presence of the Shekhin in the temple. And even in the rabbinic era, God's presence can be found in Jewish law. So the, message has, the method has changed, but the core has remained the same. So this is, this is what he's going to 
elaborates further in this chapter. So basically, the temple, the physical structure, which Hashem wanted this to be his home, was more like a model. It worked at that time. The method of how to do it was the temple. But the, 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 the core, what is the core? The core is Hashem wants to have a home. Home does not mean a physical structure. People back then, because they were uh, slaves in mm -hmm. Egypt and they were coming from a very, uh, a, a very, uh, you know, a non-spiritual place, they kind of needed a physical structure to kind of feel motivated to do to make a, to make a home for Hashem. But the the home for Hashem is found in what? Is found in the will of Hashem. Where is the will of Hashem expressed? In Torah. Torah is the will of Hashem. So, 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 so the Talmud says, when the temple was destroyed, and listen how powerful that is. The temple destroyed, where do, you, where do we build, where is the dwelling place for Hashem? In the four cubits of Torah. In the four cubits of Torah is the definition, wherever you study Torah, that's where Hashem, Hashem's dwelling place happens. Because that's where you're expressing Hashem's inner will. I have a question. So as we're gonna, we're, we're, we're gonna see soon that in the, the, the author of the Zohar, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who witnessed the destruction of the temple by the Romans, when he was studying this, he was crying and he was smiling. And he told the son, only if you understand you can cry and, 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 and smile at the same time. Because, because deep, there is a deep purpose why the temple was destroyed. Of course, on the, on, on the outside, we know the temple was destroyed because the Jews, Jewish people were not behaving. They hated each other, the Romans came. But there's something much more spiritual to it. And Rabbi Shimon understood that yes, the physical structure got destroyed but that wasn't the end of God's dwelling place. On the contrary, now we were, are, are actually have the opportunity to bring Hashem in every space in the world. Where do you bring, how do you bring Hashem in every space in the world? By bringing Torah. Wherever you go, the purpose is to bring Torah, to do a mitzvah in every space. And that's where now the, in a sense, the whole temple expanded. Let's continue, and then we'll take more questions. 381, section two, how your mind can become a God's temple. All this provision a lesson in your daily struggle to become aware of God's presence. Chapter 32 taught us that a true home for God is made when your consciousness is filled with the non-dual awareness of God's presence. But what do you do when your mind doesn't produce the desire? So Tanya offers us a lesson from history. And the revelation of Sinai couldn't be contained. They built the temple to contain it. So if your mind can contain the divine, make yourself a temple, immerse yourself in the four cubits of Jewish law. So therefore, after you have probed with your mind to be the best of your ability, the above idea of, ex of extinguishing your separate identity through awareness of God's non-duality as we discussed in chapter 33, when your mind has reached its limits, and you can't focus on it anymore, say the following to your heart, being that my mind and soul root are too inadequate to become a genuine, consistent chariot of tabernacle for God's non-dual oneness, since my mind cannot grasp or understand him in any way at all with any thought system in the world, not even attack and of the grasp of the patriarchs or the prophets. This being the case, I shall make myself a chariot for him and a firm place for his resting in a different way. That is possible for me through immersion in Torah study, scheduling fixed time for study day and night, and according to the time available to me. So, so no matter how much you struggle to appreciate God's non-dual oneness, you can always make yourself a temple to the divine presence with the study of sacred texts. In fact, even if you're not a Torah scholar and have limited time and ability to study, this path is still open to you so long as you follow the, the decree that was issued to each and every person in the law of Torah study. 
concerning how much each person ought to study, in accordance with the teaching of our sages of blessed memory, that it's that it's if time and the ability are lacking, then it's enough, even if a person has repeated only a single chapter in the morning and only a single chapter in the evening. And this shall cheer your heart and cause you to rejoice, giving thanks for you a lot in life with joy and with gladness of heart. The meriting when you study a single chapter twice a day to be a host for the Almighty. According to the limits of your avail available time, according to the opportunity, opp the opportunities lavished upon you upon you by God. So, just to elaborate a little bit more in simple terms, we spoke in the other chapter that the con the elevated consciousness of feeling and knowing that God is the only existence, right? The non-dual reality, meaning that everything in this world is Hashem and and nothing else really exists. That is that that is a huge uh, um, 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 consciousness that is not easy to attain. You can do it by meditation and do it from time to time. But that's not something that that's that, that is go that that we are necessarily on that level. So who achieved those levels? The patriarchs, Mo Moses, the prophets. They achieved. They were const in a constant state of chariots, meaning that they never felt their own that they were an independent existence. The entire existence was a flow of Hashem. That's how they not only felt, that's how they believed, how they understood. Because they grasped that type of deep consciousness. Which when you have that, when you become a complete flow of Hashem, that's when Hashem is coming in. That's when Hashem is dwelling. Hashem cannot dwell in a place where there's no room for Him, so to speak. Once the, the Baal Shem Tov came to a town and the town had a lot of arrogant people. And who were the most arrogant people? The Torah scholars. Because they didn't learn, uh, they didn't learn um, the deeper teachings of Hasidus and, and, and Kabbalah. So their teaching in Torah law was that, that's that you know, typically people who people of intellect. People who, who, who study, who um, become, become, a, and become scholars, many of them become very arrogant people. Why? Because they feel, they feel that they are on a higher level than others because I understand better, right? They have a hard time relating to people who are not intellectuals. The whole societies, right? They, can, they, they, they look down at people who are simple. The Vashanto came to teach that we have to elevate everybody, has everybody should be, be welcome, everybody should be loved. And that only comes when people learn how to be humble. Humility is not just the word, yes, I'm humble. Humility is a deep conviction. So Torah study without humility, Torah study without the presence of understanding of godliness and spirituality can be just an intellectual experience can and led many scholars to become very arrogant. Hmm. I mean, till today, I, 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 I have met people in the Torah world who don't in internalize teachings of Hasidus and their, their, their learning becomes very arrogant. Funny stories. But the story about Shem Tov, and, and everybody falls, fall, falls for this himself. Think about people who become more religious or more observant. Many times that creates a lot of friction in the families. Child, or son, or daughter becomes religious or cousin, becomes very, 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 uh, becomes a lot of friction. Why? Because those religious or new religious people, all of a sudden, they feel that they got the truth. Right? They got the truth and you don't have the truth. And they have a hard time relating. So the 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 the, the, the it's it's a it's it's an, it's a, it's one of it's a, it's a challenge and, a, and it needs guidance because you they mean well perhaps, but Torah that leads to arrogance or feeling aloof is is the opposite of Torah. 
So the Rebbe taught us to be unconditional love every person, every, every, every Jew, every human being, and not allow the knowledge that we have to, 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 to inflate our ego. On the contrary, knowledge should make you more humble. So back to the story. The Vashento comes to a town of these arrogant scholars, and they're all excited that Vashento came, and they, want, they invited him to come to the synagogue. And he says, there's no room for me in the synagogue. So what do you mean there's no room? We made you room. There's plenty of room. He says the ego of each human is so, each, each scholar in this synagogue is so large, there's no room for me to enter this place. And, and similar, it says, uh, Hashem actually expressed this, where he says, Ein ani the Me and him cannot be together, cannot live together. If there's, wherever there's ego, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot dwell. It's one reason why there were the 10 plagues in Egypt, we read in the Parsha, where Hashem tells the Moshe, Boyal Paroi, come with me to Paroi. The whole purpose was to crush Paroi's ego. It wasn't just to let the Jews people out. Hashem needed first to crush, to hum- that there should be humility, that Pharaoh should re- see that this is Hashem. And by extension, the Jewish people too. So, 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 so what happens if I don't have that consciousness? So that's great for the great people who have constant consciousness of Hashem and the humble and the vehicles to Hashem's and the, and the voice of Hashem speaks through the thoughts, meaning there's no, there's no filters. It's, mm-hmm. They're hundred percent in line with Hashem. That's all nice and good. But practically they went on that level. So Tanya says for that, you need, you, Hashem gave you the ability to the mitzvah of studying Torah. Study Torah. When you study Torah, the, the moments you study Torah, what is Torah? Torah is the wisdom and the will of Hashem. When I said earlier about a mission statement, there's a mission statement. And once you, you want to build a building, you need to have a purpose and mission. And the first thing you have to do when you have the vision and the purpose, what you want to build, then you start to draw a blueprint, right? And the blueprint is what leads and how you build the buildings. During construction, you follow the blueprint. After construction is finished, you don't throw out the blueprint. Why not? Because whenever something you try to fix something or something goes wrong, you got to go look back at the blueprint, how where the pipes are under the under the building, so you know how to fix it. You know how the you want to know how the house functions? You got to look into the blueprint. Similar, the Zora says, when Hashem created the world, Hashem looked into his blueprint. What's the blueprint? I quote the Zohar in Aramaic, Estakel ba'araisa u'bara alma. Hashem looked into his Torah and he created the world. The Torah is the blueprint of, of the universe. Even the Torah was given two and a half thousand years after creation. But that's the Torah Hashem told the Jewish people at Sinai. That Torah existed before creation. What does it mean? How does it create? How does, it, how does something create? How does something exist before creation? Before time and space, how can something be, how can something exist? So if you look at Torah as a book of laws, as a book of stories, that's a good question. But that's not what Torah is, is, is in its core. Torah in its core is the essence of Hashem. It's the wisdom and the will of Hashem, which we learned in chapter four, that unlike humans, wisdom and the intellect that we develop is separate of who we are. Hashem's wisdom is one with Hashem. Hashem's will is one with Hashem. So what is the Torah? Torah is the wisdom and the will and the essence of Hashem. When I study Torah, I am actually bringing the essence and the will of Hashem in my space. That is the temple that I am creating. So you can struggle with the knowledge of Hashem. You can struggle with that you are not a tzaddik. You are, you know, trying to be a benini. We're not every moment. I feel the, 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 the consciousness, the elevated consciousness of our God's non-dual unity. 
But when I study Torah, when I study Torah, and, 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 and it doesn't have to be every moment. If you can, of course. But that's what he says. The minimum requirement is to study a chapter in the morning, a chapter in the evening. So that moment, you are creating a dwelling space for Hashem. And more so, he's going to say, that not only that moment, but the remainder of the time that you're not studying Torah is also a dwelling place for Hashem. Because it extends the learning that you have just accomplished. And this is the next section. Oops, wait. Okay, I have to leave it for next week. And, and we'll go into other mitzvahs of Tzedakah. That staka also is, is part of that dwelling place because I'm giving away something that I worked so hard for. So I give away 10% of my earnings to tzedakah. I'm creating the will of Hashem. I'm creating a little a, a temple where Hashem feels at home. But how about the rest of my 90% of my earnings, which I keep for myself? How has that become a dwelling place? And he's going to explain, that's beautiful, that by giving tzedakah, the remaining money that you have becomes elevated, becomes purposeful and meaningful. Whew. All right, <laughs> exhale. <laughs> Let me start. I have a question. Yes. I I open. Oh, okay, you wanna go ahead. No, 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 no. You, you, you go first. I just often hear people say, this is my tikkun. Not tikkun alone. Jesus, this is my tikkun. Is that correct to interpret this is my mission in life? My destiny? Um, the word, actually, when we use, when people use the word tikkun, tik, um, tikkun is, a, is it translates to a fix, a fixing. Um, so, so fixing and mission are two, are two things. Fixing, typically, when I say, what is my tikkun? In, in, in talking about in, in Jewish language, is something that I perhaps missed in a previous lifetime, or something I did something in, in something that I need a tikkun, I need a fix. So, in, in in Jewish law, in mysticism, for example, uh, we learn in Tanya certain things as well. If I if I God forbid somebody somebody did something wrong between them and Hashem, now talking between people and people is it's you got you got you got to you got to work that together. Well, let's say I, uh, you know, I, I violated the Shabbos or I ate non-kosher. So there's, there is, so it's, is it, was it done on purpose? Was it done not on purpose? Okay, so, so but no matter what, an action was done and that action creates a certain spiritual imperfection. The tikkun can cleanse that or fix it. And every mitzvah or or or, maybe or 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 violation has specific tikkuns to that specific thing so if it's if it's tzedakah if it's uh, if it's uh, keeping shabbos a uh, few extra minutes or if it's if it's um, studying more torah so so and and th there are prescription like a prescription of certain things how to what to do and all the times fasting was a big tikkun to people's uh, violations of sins that they have done. Tikkun of a previous lifetime is typically the mission of why you're here. Mm -hmm. And when we come to a reincarnation of souls coming back, it's because you come here because you didn't come through something in a previous lifetime. So focus what the mission is to make sure you fix it. How do you know? How do, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> So, Rabbi, we could start from with ourselves. Is that fixing the world? That's start all you can do. with oh. ourselves. That's all you can do. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's uh, exactly all, all you can. Not all you can do. That's that's where it all begins. Yes. Right? Yes. So it's conquer yeah. ourselves first. The famous, the famous, uh, the famous uh, saying: I tried to fix the world, and I see I couldn't do it. So I decided I'm going to fix my country. Then I decided that I can't fix my country. I decided to fix my city. Then, I, then my, uh, and my community, then my family. I said I can't do my family. I decided I stop fixing myself. And, right. uh, and it's, 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 it speaks so much true today when uh, everyone's screaming, yelling at each other, because uh, we just uh, we 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 uh, we have this uh, certain feel good attitude. That, um, that we gotta fix everything. That we gotta fix the big issues. 
Yes, I was so first. Yes. And you are the fault why the big issues don't don't work. You are the fault. <laughs> <laughs> each other. Well, it's always easy to blame somebody, anybody, but you know that's how it's probably everything starts. All right. But it's back to what you were talking about. This, this is an enormous. Uh, Another six class. It, it's like who. Who can fulfill so great a mission? A, how few people on this earth care to do so, let alone call themselves Jews. Look at all of those Jews. How many want to read Torah or do or feel that's their temple? I mean, it's just, this is the part that perplexes my mind because I, it's like God being so big, so many people, if his spark is in every single person, how few people are trying to create mitzvah connection, um, let alone cure the imperfections. For me, it's like, God forbid, well, I better know what it is. I'll take care of it now. I don't want to come back here. So <laughs> it's uh, overwhelming for me. <laughs> Yes, it, it, well, if you if you if you if we we'll go back to the last few chapters, it is overwhelming, but it's also overwhelmingly um, powerful that you are the one that Hashem chose you with such a, with, with with such a mandate, um, and, and 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 Hashem is Hashem is talking to each individual, and each individual's action means a world to Hashem. So it's not. A, um, it's not that you need to change the whole world in the sense that it's all up to you, but you have to you have to change your own world. You have to you have to take on in your own world, and, and, and your own world's action means the world to Hashem. So on your level, where you at, it's not all or nothing. But you know the, the gift that that I have this knowledge that I'm studying this and that I can actually. And that my, my one mitzvah means so much. It's so powerful. Is empowering. It's 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 a. Uh, it doesn't make me feel I'm just another speck in in this great universe that I'm so meaningless. It it, it fills my, my my life. That that's not it. it. You understand what I mean. And that and that that is not what bothers me. What bothers me is how small this Jewish concept is. How few of the Jews, you're Orthodox, but how many can keep everything, let alone the, how few even try. And so of that speck in the population, I mean, I don't really expect you to answer that. No, but nobody I, knows. Get it. But, how many people, how, who did Hashem pick as his nation? The smallest of all people, right? Um, um, so, uh, and when, when, when people cannot talk to each other, cannot come to one consensus, even in Israel. So, so, so the 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 the, the it, I I leave this I leave this job up to Hashem. In other words, I I get it. It's frustrating okay. because you okay. you just want to scream and and teach. Yes. And but that but that that is exactly right. It's exactly the beauty that 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 first of all a lot more people have this this teachings today than than in a sense than before that's the beauty of, of, of hasidic teaching and tanya and technology today that millions of people are studying torah more than than ever before in a sense more people are studying torah than ever in history even at the observance level maybe not on the same and all the times regular people couldn't study torah they were they were not taught they were not they were in the shtetls only the rabbis and the few scholars knew how to really learn Torah. The other ones were farmers and how they knew how to read. So the, 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 yes, we are a minority. And within the, within the Jews, the top people who are studying Torah are a minority. But that is exactly where we at talking about transforming the world. You know, I can teach to 10 people here and I can put it on YouTube and now Few hundred people are listening to the class, and you can go out and teach it to your circle and affect a hundred people. And it's, it's not about 
seven billion people, everybody should now learn Tanya. But to elevate the consciousness of, of why we're here and to make the world a better place is, is what ushers in the transformation that we're all yearning to happen. And in a sense, that's again, in a sense, what is and what, what I strongly believe is in general, in general, more people are doing good and want to do good than, than ever before. I agree. Perhaps ever in history. I agree with that. Now you listen to the news, the news doesn't tell you that. The news pictures a whole different picture. But if you, if, but in general, people are, you know, we live in a very lesser country where we can express our freedom. So it's a country of kindness and, and a, a charitable country to a certain extent. We need to obviously teach our youth and, and, and keep, not take it for granted. I, I don't know. I don't know. You guys are older than me, but tell me, was it during, the, during, during World War II, America was more uh, Jew friendly than today, or America was more charitable than today? I don't believe. No, so. no I don't think so. And I think that whether, whether it's the path, though, to, and education itself. Today, a lot more people are educated than ever in history. And there, they are. Whether we agree with quote unquote the other side there is still their desire to do good. They just think it's their way of doing good. And who's to say? I mean, in some ways, we all have to, you know, live our conscience. But still, so we're, 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 and that's the beauty. We're fighting over who can do better. Exactly. We're fighting wars. How can we kill more people? And, and I have to go. Still alive and dwelling in this place, in, in this world. Yes. And, and. Yeah. And, and the last part I want to say, and not to, not to, that we have to look at the history of the world. Exactly. That, that, that it's compounding. It's a compounding of, of mitzvahs and Torah and goodness and spirituality. In other words, yeah, just like when you, when you, you know, how do you mass uh, uh, well? The word when, when, exponential versus arithmetic. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, so we look sometimes, yeah, exactly. So, so we, it's not that the previous generation's uh, doing is gone. All the doings have built up this huge thing of spirituality right. that is in existence. And we just, we already on the, on the we're just going to finish the, the, the buttons and the, and the, the hand, door handles. Do another mitzvah, do another mitzvah. That one mitzvah can actually get the CEO, the, the, the CEO of the temple that we're all waiting for. May it happen speedily. I got to run this great class. Thank you. All the best.